document. Perhaps we could get started with the first round table then, if you don't have any questions. This shared um, dimension of the digital revolution uh, will uh, bring probably Francois Asselin to the pulpit, who is um, presiding the CPME, and he will join us on stage here. You're um, managing and uh, heading a private company, so you feel at home here, if I dare say. And there's Pascal, whom you've already met before, Jean-Marc Tassetou, who's a former CEO of Google between 2010 to 2013. He was also co-founder of Corp Academy, a provider of MOOC solutions, which we'll be discussing later on. Then there's also Antonio Costanzo, who's uh, head of the public affairs in Uber, the Uber company for the southern region. <coughs> so he's a pure representative of those uh, pure players' generation. And then finally, Marie-Lise Léon whom I couldn't spot in the audience at first and whom I shouldn't have in, should have introduced first, of course, out of gallantry. Uh, Marie-Lise, thank you for being with us. You are National Secretary at the CFTT, which is the first uh, trade union. A trade union represented on board of Antec, but in France as well. And you're in charge of uh, the digital as well as social dialogue under the aegis of this uh, trade union. So this is pretty much at the heart of our subject matter. We can here obviously pride ourselves of having a panel of uh, speakers sufficiently expert and diver with diversified background basically in order for them to react um, and brainstorm on various hopefully converging solutions and issues on this subject matter. Perhaps I'd like to start with you. If you don't mind, I would say that in order to structure our subject around this roundtable, um, I'd like you to uh, raise four major subject matter. The added value, first of all. What does the digital rev revolution bring in terms of added value, then in terms of shapes? Um, existing shapes for the organization of work. As we know, the, for example, the boss of Blablacar uh, couldn't have made it without the um, existence of di this uh, digital dimension. Are there less obstacles to the uh, newcomers and entrants in terms of uh, structures and forms of enterprises, basically? Are there any um, value destructions in the Schumpeterian sense uh, entailed by this digital revolution. And it's good, again, that our various guests uh, be present here to voice possibly their opinion in terms of uh, dependent status or collateral damages of this digital revolution. Then a third aspect is um, a more uh, statistical chapter, perhaps, that would give us a few figures in order to better um, visualize what this digital revolution leads us to. And the fourth and last chapter would perhaps um, lead us to um, drive us to a dumb rate, the solution, the possible solutions. Um, matching the issues raised. Now, I'm turning to Jean-Marc Tasset, as I said, who was, uh, well, was presided and founded the Corp Academy, as we said, which um, has a, a fantastic purpose, as it aims at sharing knowledge and training among companies, the academic world, and providing a series of services with interesting added values in the industry of knowledge, basically. And then you're coming from a very interesting background as you worked for Google, as we know, uh, with uh, its over uh, $1.5 billion uh, of uh, Turnover in terms of advertising, of which you were for which you were responsible, I believe. And you will be able to tell us a little bit more about the changing or evolving business models in these uh, different environments, presumably. Okay, so I hope you have at least three hours in front of you. But um, to bounce on what you just said, Cyril, and it, what is 
very interesting, I think. Um, with the technological uh, disruptions that arose lately, there are a number of uh, economic business models that were also uh, broken down, basically, and disrupted. And uh, I can think of especially two key moments a turning point in the Google integration story, for example, the uh, takeover by Yahoo. And the second key moment had to do with the invention of totally new and innovative model. You quoted Airbnb, for example, um, whose um, margin, margins have now taken over the ACO group in the meantime, but there's always a uh, destruction of the pricing model that goes along with this sort of revolution. Another aspect that has struck me during in my Google career, which after all uh, only represents 10% of my global career, but it is an emblematic part, I have to admit. When you had a chance to discuss with the major entrepreneurs of the web, their key word is always to be cracking a new subject matter, a new taboo, basically. And what seems to be a bit of a challenge in the new 21st century matrix-shaped companies that are organized around specific corporations. The second revolution, um, industrial revolution, as we know, had to do with a, a verticalization, basically, of the, the professional sectors, uh, agricultural, industrial, and, and the tertiary services. And this one is a totally horizontal one, which um, revolutionizes the relationship structure between all the stakeholders from top to bottom, basically. And breaks down the previous uh, hierarchies. So if you look at the architecture of the headquarters of the major GAFA uh, plays in California, well, they're uh, completely um, horizontal. There are no more towers being built. These uh, typical economic erections in the literal sense are no longer uh, the hype, basically, that the headquarters need to be built, integrated in the landscape as horizontally and harmoniously as possible. So we're not uh, quite aware, I think, although this revolution was started more than 20 years ago, some uh, things will only appear or transpire into the uh, history books of uh, economic revolutions later on. And I'd like to finish, perhaps, we always start off with the question of the destruction of value uh, rather than with the creation of value. But we know that the first industrial revolution between the um, 15th and the 19th century lasted about 400 years. The second one lasted only 150, and this one has reached its full speed um, perhaps 15 years ago. And the really traumatizing uh, characteristic of this revolution is, is precisely its speed, basically. Uh, we, um, at a modest scale, were just a startup uh, three or four years ago. As a corporate academy, have managed to more or less catch the train, uh, but for others, I think the challenge is um, much um, more of an issue in terms of sharing the benefits of this revolution. Now, thank you, Jean-Marc. Antonio, uh, you are managing the southern region of uh, the Uber company, of which France is a part, of course. And the immediate specialization that is permitted by internet has enabled you to create new services, but also to position yourself differently in terms of price, because this has broken up with the previous monopolistic structure of the taxi um, companies, basically, but we'll also discuss another type of value destruction in terms of social protection, and that seems to have been avoid unavoidable as well. We know that there are perhaps 12 to 13,000 uh, drivers um, were able to enter the market, the taxi driver market, creating thereby value, of course. So what would you say are the most striking features of these social and economic contributions by Uber? Thank you very much. Well, in a few words, I'll try to summarize what Uber is all about, uh, among others, in France. As you know, France entered the French market since 2012. We've entered essentially two um, niches of the transport market, the transport of people and transport of, of food, of uh, specific products and services for food delivery. 
this a little later on. And these two types of services have had a very strong impact on two categories of people, perhaps three, I would even say. On the one hand, the passengers who use these services, and on the other hand, the chauffeurs or drivers who are able to reach out to new clients or develop new services, and then the um, uh, restaurant or food um, entrepreneurs, basically. So as you know, the passengers um, market is rather strongly regulated, and our status is that of an intermediary. So we're putting ourselves in the shoes of what the um, taxi call centers used to do. Basically, we do it in a different way, thanks to the technological breakthrough of the internet. So we um, took a leap into this market thanks to the digital revolution indirectly. And, uh, of course, one of the premises of our entrance on this market was that the prior service was too expensive, in our view. So that is why we took the stance of offering a better quality and lower priced um, service of a similar nature. But what clearly appeared in our vision of things was that we had to intervene in a sector uh, which clearly presented a demand for mutation, for change. trying to impose our democratic vision of this, uh, the uh, necessary adjustment to this market uh, sector. And um, of course, this did not preclude higher quality services to carry on existing, some sort of luxury uh, transports will always be necessary and called for. Um, So as you rightly pointed out, the um, Uber French version, which uh, I think um, transits via five different platforms, we have um, um, a number of competitors, um, contrary to what people may think. Anyway, these newcomers have enabled um, a lot of jobs to be created and new um, drivers to be employed. We consider that there are about 25,000 drivers of VTC in France. And a, a Boston Group Consulting a study also says that in the first semester of 2016, one out of four employment creation uh, stemmed from the VTC um, sector. And in terms of absolute value, the VTC sector in 2016 was worth about 800 million turnover, and the estimation is according to the re-evaluation of these statistics, which should be published uh, by uh, the end of the year, should amount to about 320 billion euros by the turn of the year. So this is just uh, to brush a, a, a rough picture of uh, the general landscape, basically, with the different types of uh, services, um, including the less well-known food delivery aspect that, uh, in fact, generated a lot of value creation on the side of the restaurant uh, rather than on the service side, because without needing to invest in a bigger location, venue, or set of kitchens and equipment or utensils, they were able to spread their uh, supply differently. And that is perhaps the, the, the population concerned with major, um, concerned by the most uh, dramatic impact of uh, value creation. Thank you already for this first uh, general introduction. We'll discuss later the more disruptive aspects of the value destruction on the social front. We know that Uber is also investing abroad in Egypt and elsewhere. Yes, regarding freight anyway, um, the American platform has just launched a new platform, which will also change our vision, I think, of the merchandise freight, yes. Yes, exactly. And then a series of uh, itinerary and routing services should also be... uh, further developed from what I uh, heard or understood. So more than 150,000 very small or medium and small-sized companies are uh, concerned. Um, More than 3 million employees under the ages of these companies. How do you perceive this digital revolution in terms of services provided for all these 
people and uh, to the smaller units of uh, uh, companies contribute, basically. Yes, the very, um, at the very bottom of the chain, we've got all sorts of startups, of course. They're not all members of a true classical trade union in the way we know it, because when you become a member of trade unions, or other professional organizations such as UNTEC, there is, of course, a bit of a militant political um, commitment entailed by this. You're supposed to be solidary with other co-opted members. Whereas the startup model, when you look at it, is um, more a pragmatic matter of contributing funds. So the entrepreneurial project differs from the classical project because we see startups um, mushrooming when there are too many um, too many cases in court um, needed for sorting the uh, gray zones between uh, the previous economic relationships. So this is only to say that at the end of the day, this famous digital revolution is hitting us in all directions and uh, in various ways. We have more or less 200 branches, which are members of the CPME. I was elected president two years and a half ago, and I was able to witness exchanges from the very beginning of my election, rather flabbergasting, where you saw people expecting the whole branch to, uh, to disappear. I can remember a manager who was uh, rivaled by some, uh, so many competitors that basically he had to move out to some neighbors. I can think of some restaurants uh, whom we had supported in the beginning in order to um, cancel them and defend them against e-booking because the digitalization of their profession had cut them off from their uh, from any direct relationship to their clients um, because of these abusive positions of the intermediaries. When you Googled their name, basically, you couldn't fall on their own website. You had to transit via e-booking, for example. And these are rather... Um, important issues when you think of the human dimension, basically, the fact that these people who've invested all their lifetime, basically, into building a company, an enterprise, a name, or reputation, and suddenly find themselves being listed and ranking second after an intermediary um, who needs to abide by a series of security regulations for the uh, cold uh, chain uh, preparation of meals or distribution of uh, alcohol and selling of alcohol licenses and, and there are of course mini or self or auto entrepreneurial status which may appear as an alternative solution to free them a little bit from these constraints but Whatever the shape you utilize, we're trying to defend their will and their initial intention. But in this vortex of uh, conflicting influences, we have to really come back to the fundamentals, I think, in order to better understand what's going on, basically, and to stop erring, basically. So if the system it turns uh, itself against the, uh, the human beings who designed it in the beginning, then there's something wrong, basically. Second, um, presupposition is basically that we've got a common good. Um, and any economic initiative should have um, a solidary uh, counterpart, if you like. You can't afford nowadays to have an economic activity of any sort and simply pay taxes without caring about and, for example, we've had to come to this Congress here in Lille using trains on uh, specific railways which need to be lit up at night and so on. So we basically shouldn't tolerate to be um, 
to be cast aside by um, external competitors who have no tax uh, or social system uh, to deal with, basically, because this is clearly an unfair type of competition. So the status of employee is the most directly and clearly impacted by um, the digital revolution. So in the um, permanent construction economies, it should be a, a major and rather central uh, subject of discussion, I believe. If you decide to opt for the cheapest option, where and what will happen to, where will be and what will happen to the social cover and um, uh, the welfare dimension of the state. Mm. So many professions will be threatened if you do not benefit from the minimal training in order to not lie to your clients or to yourself, basically, on these issues. So we are all deeply, um, in the context of the CPME anyway, in favor of the new technologies benefits of course we don't have a choice but you have to remain in order to be a true visionary you have to remain responsible and sense sensitive to um, the social dimension which is sometimes cast aside or at least doesn't evolve at the same speed as the rest of the technical fundamentals because we don't want to go back to the jungle a book, basically. So, what do you think is the way forward? Some sort of regulation? Of course, we need um, some sort of regulation and no excess. We made uh, 16 very concrete proposals um, on behalf of the CPME in order to create um, a fair type of competition in a fair level playing field for all of us, basically. Yes, we've got very positive examples on the other hand about this digital resolution. We shouldn't draw too much of a black picture. For example, classical taxis have also um, seen part of their publicity being made, and they've also had to make progress on terms, in terms of uh, um, tariffs, of course, because they had to question their own their own uh, principles in view of the newcomers' um, competition. So this has been opening up markets that we hadn't even thought of. There are some true novel opportunities that were certainly brought about by the digital revolution. And on the other hand, a project that, I, that really um, stays close to the CPME heart and that was part of the current presidential campaign's promises, in fact, hopefully, um, something that won't be cast uh, aside too fast. That's to say the development of a collaborative status. Why? Because we are operating in a sector where there is a considerable immaterial investment. For example, there are about 150,000 euros worth of training in order to master um, the operation of a robot of any kind. And if tomorrow a status of digital transformation uh, were developed, properly developed so as to amortize the material investment on several years that need to be done, uh, in order uh, for startups to reap the benefits of these technical assets, then we would all be winners. Thank you very much, Francoise. Marie-Lise Leon, now you're also sitting at the heart of the debate between social uh, dialogue and uh, digital revolution. Where would you? Uh, say the most relevant added, view, uh, added value, sorry, finds its way. Uh, you have to defend the employee's uh, interest, but also more and more the freelancers and independents um, point of view. And you're even editing a platform, I believe, that is providing services of uh, social nature to the freelance freelancers as well. So uh, in your quality of representative of the most uh, well-briefed trade union on this subject, what would be the um, independent workers' point of view. Thank you very much and good day to all of you. Um, thank you for this brief introduction. I'd like to start by introducing you to the uh, specific vision that our trade union philosophy has developed in um, nowadays, well, in those modern days, basically, where we are undeniably um, all experiencing a mutating 
um, economic situation giving us, because we're standing at a crossroad basically, that is giving us the opportunity to both putting the economy back at its rightest place where it should be by redefining a series of criteria that uh, should be performance indicators perhaps for companies um, that so far have only taken into account the financial dimension, whereas we are more and more aware, I think, of the um, lacunas, basically, of this uh, operating mode that uh, leaves out too many social dimensions, obviously, of the company. And this rather abrupt or violent uh, change of time imposes us to search for and look for new um, solutions, uh, meeting the new challenges, basically. That's a new, a real social challenge. And that's the way we see things, which isn't the case of all trade union companies. Um, and perhaps that is a, a digression that would be useful for our international guests, especially. They should, should bear in mind, perhaps, that our trade union tradition in France is uh, presenting us with a rather diversified landscape. And there are a number of uh, diverging branches. and. Uh, the CFTT is a trade union that aims at the protection and defense of the, the employees, uh, or the workers. So, or rather of workers in general, which would not limit us to the employees benefiting from a working open-ended contract, for example. So nowadays, even though I am not convinced that we have reached the end of an era um, regarding the traditional forms of employment contracts, we are clearly witnessing the development of a new form characteristic of the digital era and ensuing from some of these mutations once they've actually settled down because the digital sector, and I'm thinking among others of the person or passengers transport sector, the users are so satisfied and happy with the new alternative formulas offered to them that regulating this would be going against the grain and would probably um, not be a feasible or doable option. Nevertheless, there are workers who commit more to these novel forms of employment and yet no longer benefit from these social security protections or covers that were offered to the prior or more traditional forms of contracts. So here there is a gap to be bridged. And all these new elements, um, of course, uh, disturb or force our old traditional trade union structures to question themselves and to categorize or scan through the existing forms of employment. Because when we talk about social dialogue, we, are, we traditionally confront the uh, workers or the employees uh, in front of the employers. And where would the independents, for example, or freelancers choose to sit around those negotiation tables? That is part of the interesting novel questions arising that we're trying to handle now in an experimental way, basically. Um, by learning by doing. So what I also wanted to raise was the question pertaining to this digital transformation, notwithstanding the purely technical dimension of this uh, revolution, because that would um, prevent us from seeing the more global picture of this change. In fact, what we have to bear in mind is that all the activity sectors are concerned equally. I am in charge of digital and industrial questions, where therefore um, talking with a consortium of companies from the uh, major industries. And what is rather striking is that our opinion, which is rather broadly shared with employers is that the 
men, the human, not men or women, I mean, the human factor is really a key element at this, the heart or the center of this revolution, in fact. Granted that there are some employment being destroyed by these novel market changes, but if we are putting ourselves in a position to anticipate and foresee the future directions, then we shall be able to capitalize on all the um, positive technical changes of the past 20 years and how to secure them a number of social rights would be to simply make sure that those social rights um, be associated no longer with a position or a professional status, but with a person. And that would enable, of course, the challenge is to not make everything fall back on the individual. We've got to find some sort of balance. We've got to make sure that he can acquire a number of rights and feel secure in his itinerary and uh, a context or a framework of collective rules. And that is, I think, what trade unions should be uh, trying to pick up on in terms of the future uh, structural challenges, how to best accompany our workers through the various um, ranges of choices that they're confronted to, of course, mobility being a major one of them. There's nothing as horrible for a worker to be obliged to basically relocate or uh, change course when he wasn't given a choice, when he, when he doesn't have a, an alternative. But the idea is to make sure that there's always a, an, open, uh, an open bubble of dialogue that lets the not only economic but social um, dimensions to be integrated in the negotiation or in the discussion. And that usually leads to better quality choices um, and more uh, mid or long term visions for the employees. So you've already made a great progress. And I think you're editing yourself a platform, aren't you, that is open to uh, some freelance workers, even though they only represent 1% of your turnover right now. But basically, you're um, embodying part of your ideals in as much as you're really turning towards um, the client's interest in his in its own range and diversity, uh, no matter what sort of uh, wealth they can uh, contribute to you. And so we've got one trade, you know, I think, that has turned itself had to has had to rethink its own business model, hasn't it? Yes, although it's only um, operating at an experimental stage. But to be honest, I think the trade unions image in France certainly would benefit from a rebranding in a way. It is not always associated with the uh, deep down, creative, innovative concepts. We're not very well known. I think part of today's trade union's role um, is to perhaps rejuvenate its uh, fundamentals. Of course, our protective paternalistic role is still historically there, but we can't handle nowadays modern challenges by um, retaining that sort of um, image. So we've got to find a balance between these trends. We launched seven various projects uh, regarding independent workers or freelancers that reflect a true perception of the trade union's tenets that we are defending. That is to say that trade unions should defend also specific services. And in the context of this union pack that we're offering, um, we want to make sure that provided these freelancers are interested in becoming members and affiliate our organization, uh, they can benefit from a series of services offered to them as well. And one of the trade un French trade union's characteristics is that, as you know, may or may not know, we're in charge of negotiating tariff barriers that apply to all workers, whether members or not. So we've got to make sure that we distinguish ourselves in the eyes of our members um, as being not only useful, but also 
collectively speaking on behalf of the whole company. Yes, what I think what the CFTT did is very cunning indeed, because at the CPME we could have done the same. We could even imagine tomorrow, for example, that the uh, chairman of the CPME be a member or affiliated to the CFTT. Of course, I'm uh, extrapolating a little bit on trade union fictions here, but it's in theory it should be made feasible. And we can't have being both uh, taken aback by this, this sort of scenario. Um, and on the other hand, finding it a, um, encouraging and dynamic, because you could, uh, in the future, probably find some use uh, with a double status of entrepreneurial representatives as well as members of uh, the trade unions in your quality of uh, employee of another company. So where, where should we draw the line, basically, for example, uh, in Uber? I know some drivers from VTC who wanted to turn back against their um, employer um, in certain um, legal cases or confrontations that, in fact, people just um, replied to them that, no, no, there was no subordination or hierarchical relationship between the two of them as their, the nature of their relationship was purely commercial. Um, so the challenge is certainly to re-qualify the commercial contract with some form of hierarchical uh, link enabling um, the worker to benefit from a number of uh, uh, social guarantees or protection cover. Because it is frustrating indeed when you work as a complementary activity or as a full-time job uh, as a freelancer and suddenly realize that um, you cannot stop working or retire because you've not uh, made allowance for these um, side expenses. So, for example, one idea we came up with was basically to try and implement a collaborative contract. Collaborative contract which would foresee the circumstances of the uh, termination of these contracts or um, parting condition and which would nevertheless constrain the uh, freelance who is going to provide the service as well as the uh, commissioner who will have to pay for the uh, sufficiently provisioned price of the service so as to make sure that there is some sort of social uh, protection included in it. So, okay, so that's the kind of framework you want to develop. You can think of it in terms of insurance as well, um, given that it is a it remains in nature by a, since a commercial contract. Exactly, you're uh, right to point it out. In fact, it has an impact on the social right and social dimension, of course, but it is nevertheless a commercial contract. Right, that would still ensure the client remains at the center of this construction, wouldn't it? Yes, exactly. What you have to imagine is that nowadays you can see more and more entrepreneurial models whose economic model is to say that they're going to work on their own all their life long and they never will um, surround themselves by employees uh, of any kind. And when you ask, when you ask them why, uh, the answer is uh, pretty straightforward. It's too complex and too damn um, full of red tape and efficiencies, basically, so they don't want to give it a try anymore. And how can we remedy this? Well, if we don't do anything uh, on the administrative level, there will be a growing sort of gray zone economy, as we say, where people will end up working for one another, but not officially. Okay, so that poses a number of questions uh, regarding the insurance contracts, the pension rights, and a number of aspects which are, I suppose, included in your future collaborative contract and in uh, collaboration with uh, social partners. Of course, it is a highly complex issue. And what we hope for and are aiming at is that it be put on the table to make sure that it um, provides win-win solutions to all. Yes, indeed, there are pension rights, social security um, 
aspects to be dealt with and of course also the fairly natural balance that should be kept between the uh, freelancer and the commissioner. Um, and Marie-Louise, would you say that it would be um, conceivable to have a number of companies intervening in order to fund the CPA um, contract, for example, which is an existing tool already, even though it wasn't always well promoted, as you know, the CPF uh, uh, personal training account and the CPA. Yes. Well, at the CPME, we've always been in favor of this CPA, but the trouble is that it was dramatized on the political plane. And once it's taken over by the politicians, uh, things start degenerating usually because in the beginning, it was more a technical issue of making sure that it could work. And uh, that these technical points weren't uh, fine-tuned well enough at this stage because there's no point in providing employees with uh, advantages that they'll never use. And what we want to make sure is that they start from an on-field experience. For example, in the CPA's status, uh, you note that there have been major problems with the uh, tough conditions of, of work of certain uh, professions. <coughs> And this is also a reason why some of the social rights should be transferred to the person and to the people rather than to their status or their working environment. Um, today's professional paths and economic careers have nothing to do with what they had uh, looked like 40 years ago at the times of the creation of those social rights, but we've got to make sure we can preserve these assets and examine what can work technically before um, before making these advantages loom ahead too lightheartedly. Exactly. So, for example, you could stick to the old tools as CPA, but in certain, there's still a little more common sense into it, into them. Okay. So, Antonio, we've said nothing but good uh, things about Uber, which is clearly one of the most innovative players of this uh, new generation. But, um, and in terms of value creation, you're creating innovative services as well as intelligence, artificial intelligence, and employment. So these are all positive notes, even though they're not employees, um, which goes to illustrate the point of uh, Marie Louise Lyon uh, concerning independent and freelancers and their relative uh, increasing um, uh, importance in the social dialogue. And in order to interview you, I must confess that I've had to. Uh, um, use and practice or familiarize myself with Uber a little bit. So I've taken a number of Uber itineraries and routes, and they were complaining, among others, about this increase of 20 to 25% margins um, retrieved from their benefit by uh, the uh, umbrella organization um, that uh, constitutes Uber, and they believed that it was twisting or tilting slightly the uh, strength relationship between their intermediary and themselves. So aren't you creating an economic or social or both dependency of uh, the uh, drivers? And I don't know whether I should restrict myself to the passengers, drivers, or to the delivery uh, drivers, depending on your various mobility services. Well, first of all, I would like to indeed draw a clear distinction between the two categories because the delivery boys in the majority, say 90% of the cases, only work as such in uh, their quality of uh, complementary activity, basically, with respect to another pillar. Activities that are by contrast with the passengers, drivers who's, um, who tend to work full time for us and with us. So with respect to what you just um, said, indeed, uh, since the month of December, we've increased, raised our percentage of 20 to 25 percent, but it doesn't, um, it is not a, a faithful picture of reality if you don't add uh, that we also increased our prices um, of the taxi journeys by 13 percent. And this was what came out of a communication round 
that was probably ill uh, spoken of or, or not very well done and organized, basically, because um, as a result of this manipulation, many taxi drivers, the, the, the object of this manipulation came across as being an increase, an undue increase of our margins, which wasn't the case. Now, we are literally business importers for the drivers. We're passing uh, jobs on to them without uh, demanding any exclusive link. Uh, with us, they are perfectly entitled to retain their independence, work on their own, or on behalf of other intermediaries. There are, at all point in uh, time, no obligation, of course, to remain under duress um, or without their consent, members of the organization. So the client, who at the end of the day is the uh, in our case, both the driver and the customer, the passenger, needs to be satisfied with our business model. So we are certainly not um, striving to cast any uh, shadow on them, and we want to make sure that they're happy with our services. So why did we reach this confrontational Point. And again, I'm making my um, mea culpa without uh, committing uh, all the rest of my company, because perhaps not everyone shares this opinion, but personally, I remain convinced that we did um, commit a, a, a lot of communication mistakes. Uber, which is a global company operating in more than 70 countries with a technology that covers the whole planet, is confronted to extremely diversified regulations um, on the ground. There are, say, in Pakistan, for example, six million different types of regulations. In Spain, we've got three different levels of legislation that we have to make allowance for. In France, it's a more centralized state, so you only have to integrate one uh, single set of uh, legislation or regulations. So depending on where you're operating, the rules change completely. And the, I think among the first mistakes we made, we underestimated that difficulty by trying to implement our own vision of things and universalize our standard, basically. And that was a um, gross mistake. If you want to be successful in any kind of market, you've got to integrate not only the economic but the cultural dimension of this market. And in France, we were badly hit by reality in that respect, but elsewhere as well, because the a single standard doesn't apply in the field of mobility. And taking stock of that um, relative um, disappointment, where we've now tried to establish a true social dialogue with the drivers, all the representatives, representatives of these drivers, um, who can be members of all sorts of uh, federations or trade unions according to their preference. And after all, we know how uh, this decade has been characterized by a rather rigid form of social dialogue, uh, which had the merit of taking place, but I mean was limited to, as we say, uh, kind of binary dialogue between employees and employers. And now, uh, as was rightly said before, 80% of our uh, subcontractors are, of course, independent freelancers, so they need to be able to voice uh, also their interests, and I can speak um, quite frankly, I think, and at ease with my consciousness, to say that we uh, have a fundamental economic interest to realize that all of us are basically on the same boat and to integrate everybody's viewpoint. So. Um, given that you're providing rather innovative services, there is a lot of value added by dint of this sheer innovative aspect, um, which enabled some newcomers to enter the market and decide to opt for this career as uh, taxi drivers without uh, the fixed costs entailed by the previous monopolistic organizations. But the um, creation of value um, provided by these new services is also the fruit of the uh, different uh, distribution of wealth uh, by means of taxes in order to fund social security. And we know that in the case of the uh, drivers, there are no pensions 
there's all insurance involved, so you're pretty good on the statistical side. Uh, yes, you're rather mysterious in terms of uh, the financial results. So the group and it is hard for us to assess how the benefits. We know that Uber France is thanks to a rather genius final financial construction is set up in uh, uh, Delaware, <coughs> and um, therefore the social protection is kind of avoided and shunned, it seems, although it, uh, it is rarely spoken of. So the construction is both genius, as we said, but it's also scary because uh, most of your collaborators are uh, not that young anymore and will probably have to ask themselves questions about their future pensions. So the first advantage of creating wealth is to get work at all and some sort of social status, but also sharing and ironing out the discrepancies between the haves and the haves not, have nots, isn't it? Sure. We, um, now, to first of all answer your question about the transparency, we've announced 6.5 billion turnover and 2.8 billion losses. So for us, the uh, tax questions or avoid, uh, tax avoidance is not even uh, coming into play because we're not making enough money to uh, enter these considerations. Yes, but on the other hand, I didn't want to accuse you of anything, but Uber France does have a profitable result. But as you know, the division has been cleverly horizontalized so as to uh, spread evenly the benefits and make sure that there are no types of issues. But as you know, Delaware and Luxembourg are uh, the headquarters. Uh, the sites of the headquarters of the company. So, sure, I'm not, I'm not trying to beat about the bush, but how does the Uber model work for those of you who are not familiar with it, basically? You're offering services to chauffeurs, and when, for example, you pay your journey 10 euros, 7, 50 of these euros are going to be for the driver's pocket, and 2.5 euros will be returned by uh, the intermediary commi uh, commission and will therefore serve the marketing activity that is based here in France and the French company does pay taxes, may I say in passing, and all of its financial results are public. And then another part of this will serve to pay for the technological research and development costs, which aren't always performed on the French. So yes, yes, I know it's quite cleverly done. Same applies to Airbnb, sure. And the part that is dedicated to our research and development is uh, flown into the Netherlands because with the exception of the United States, uh, all of it is interestingly applying for the European Union. Now, of course, you could say that it is in a way unfair to be allowed to structure financially your company's uh, tax costs, but it is, whether one likes it or not, um, to this day enabled and permitted by the European legislation. And that is what the single market, um, part of the single market's goal and premises consisted in, so you may question this a principle, but um, after all, the European Union is only the sum of its parts, and uh, little more than a decade ago when the financial system um, ended up being shaped in a more or less consensual way, it enabled and wanted to privilege the mobility of capitals as well as persons, as you know, and that is a, a part of the European idea. Now, I have no prejudice for or against this. I come from a background of uh, the gambling industry, a uh, Kiwi company for which I worked for about 10 years, and the choice that had been made by the regulator, and we were in a similar situation, come to think of it, because our company, whether based in Malta and Gibraltar or the Rimini and Spain or whatever, was able to offer its services anywhere else in Europe and yet choose to establish its headquarters where uh, deemed appropriate. There was a derogation that um, applied to the gambling industry, um, but the tax regime's policy was very similar. 
to what is now ruling the world of most other industrial sectors. So this 20% tax that applied to the gambling companies wasn't as a big in every um, in every country, and the Europeans had agreed on compensating for it by adopting a, a joint tax at the beginning. So, okay. So would you say that in terms of training, so we've discussed already this pension rights or social security um, faulty sides perhaps of this uh, Uber model. What about training? Are there any career orientation impulses or counsels given to your drivers? We're trying to provide it as much as possible, but there's one particularly delicate question, which is that of re qualifications, retraining, in fact, um, conversion of uh, skills. And the regulation is not really giving us much flexibility or leeway on this front. True, but it is also evolving with time. The legislation is foreseeing a social responsibility for companies, which uh, implements a contribution on behalf of companies, you know, for this uh, social security um, of any workers contributing to uh, digital platforms. And so that seems to be a reliable first plank, basically, of, uh, and that is where regulation uh, comes in handily in terms of clarifying what the players may do without um, finding themselves in an illegal gray zone later on, basically. True because a certain administration of laws could have a negative impact, but there it seems to be a fairly consistent and consensuous, uh, consensual decision. True, and what about Jean-Marc? Um, would you say that you fully endorse the view of uh, Antonio, basically, that there is a certain dimension of risk-taking when you operate in this kind of model as an independent person? Um, but it is largely compensated by the flexibility given to you uh, and the freedom to find the clients that suit you. Well, I think it all brings us back to the fundamental uh, hypothesis that the human factor should remain at the center of any kind of human activity and economic model. And I have not enough knowledge about the Uber model, I know that uh, usually these companies are highly focused on the quality of the initial recruitment. They receive perhaps two million companies, two million sorry, CVs before deciding to um, um, hire this or that person. And they like to... Uh, and it was the same in the case of the Google company as in most other Gaffi, but um, obviously in terms of wealth distribution, the uh, references or benchmarks are not the same, but most of these companies know that in order to generate enough sustainable growth, you've got to put the human um, factor at the heart of your concern. And recruiting is not enough, actually, but even better is to make sure you can um, retain uh, the skilled workforce. And that the, the better way to prevent too much turnover in this field is to train them. So, I've known through major lawyers in my life. I was um, in the beginning lulled by Anton Ribou's um, motto regarding finance, the two legs basically of any human construction, the financial and the human one, and that is pretty much amounting to what the Californian uh, CEOs say, and, uh, and then apart from those, Dan and SFR and Google were my three major employers, and I've come more or less to the end of my career, whereas my children will know at least 10 different employers. So this whole notion of employability skills certainly has to be reviewed or updated per 
permanently. I, in my days, I was part of a generation where you had a time for, uh, for everything. There was a time for studying, and there was a time for working, and some exceptional um, excursion out of this path to basically re-inject yourself into a new professional path justified your uh, second uh, course or online uh, re-conversion, but that was quite exceptional. Whereas now, all these taboo subjects have been tackled already largely by the American public, a little less in France because the speed at which the digital revolution spreads and crosses the Atlantic is always slowed down a little bit by the ocean, but um, the, par the French paradox is that there is both a high rate of digitalization uh, for the French people, and yet a sort of inertia at the level of the uh, companies and institutions. But 100% of the companies can and should consider themselves hit or concerned by this digital revolution, yet at equivalent size, at re equivalent reach, and some companies make it and others don't. And I've had uh, the opportunity to already organize a number of presentations or conferences with collaborations who try to export, uh, say, fishing material or equipment, for example, uh, across the globe and become or propel themselves um, as a global player or international players, and others just didn't know what it was all about, and there was a counterculture going more and more underground. So you either adopt the codes of the digital revolution and crack a fundamental taboo in subjects, as I said, or oh, you don't. And I am um, son both of an entrepreneur but also of a school teacher, and <coughs> therefore I couldn't avoid cracking an important topic, which is that, for example, if you need 150,000 euros to train your collaborator in your quality of a small or medium-sized company, you can't afford it, obviously, and training, we can't afford to let training become an elitist occupation. So uh, we know that the standard is to spend for any company between 3 and 8 percent of your turnover into future uh, education, educational program orientation and training programs, but I think that it should be even more systematic than that. Um, uh, a time when transformation fields need perpetual reskilling, we said to ourselves we needed to bridge the gap between the uh, distance learning and the uh, vicinity or close to home in real life types and shapes of um, education and teaching. And that is why in October 2012, while I was in California, for example, I um, was fortunate to run into one of those first MOOCs performances invented by the American campuses that uh, immediately grew quite uh, popular in China. And then I decided to... Um, I met Peter, St Peter Narvi from Stanford, who had just come out of a 150,000 wide sort of open academic class. And that means that for only one euro, you can uh, provide the same class as the one that would have cost you 150,000 in the first place. So, yes, the major European leaders have lost 25% of the net results two years ago, but. Uh, it certainly. Um, um, and my quality of representative of the smaller uh, startup companies, this is none of my concern. In fact, we've got to make sure that you can crack the important innovative challenges with the necessary financial means available to you as easily and flexibly as possible. And if you move from 40, as we know, 40 to 700 million people French speakers, thanks to the African uh, continent, it's certainly worthwhile developing um, this MOOC uh, trend and surfing on the MOOC wave from the viewpoint of uh, French universities or French uh, companies. So in 
context when younger collaborators are not even interested in entering or starting a career with a multinational or bigger group. 35% of the major graduates from the bigger commercial schools now only talk about creating their startups, and it's a formidable change because 30 years ago, when I got started with my startup, it was really difficult convincing anyone to come along, whereas now it's the other way around. It's uh, bigger companies and players or multinationals who have a hard time trying to recruit because they prefer to uh, keep control on their own destiny, basically, and retain their freedom uh, uh, by creating a startup as a freelance. Absolutely, and all of this is quite important. Um, quite importantly, uh, connected, therefore, to education and schools, as we know. Um, I suppose that the FDT and the CPME, you can see, witness this sort of trend as well on a daily basis. A lot of people look for um, new profiles, new skills. 60%. We know that the robotization has an impact also on uh, working supply of uh, supply and amount of work, of course, but with the appearance of robotization and artificial intelligence, a set of new professions have emerged, uh, and training should start from, from school onward, not only education as we know, but also inside companies go on, basically. So part of your roles is certainly to bring all those corporations closer to one another and make sure that the corporations are decompartmentalized enough to foresee what the needs are of the whole branch. Yes, we certainly uh, witness a true cultural shock here, basically. Um, because some collaborators never ask themselves whether they should train uh, themselves or not. In fact, if the initiative doesn't come on behalf of the employer, the uh, question wouldn't even cross their mind. And that is the reason why I think we should uh, individualize or personalize as much as possible the training, depending on the person's profiles, basically. There are some upcoming younger generations uh, who clearly have understood and gathered by now that the training will have to be provided um, on the spot and, um, and on the field at work, basically, uh, for some aspects of their training. And if I take the example of my specific case, we are specializing in the restoration of traditional chefs-d'oeuvre and um, a woodwork of um, central historical building. And of course, competition could eat, up, uh, could eat us up very easily in terms of pure technology. The Italians or German competitors, for example, there is Pesaro, who um, wanted to have a course on how certain machines were working so that they could access by means of increased information, some new market shares. And then that is how they realized that upgrading in terms of training was worth uh, their while, even in such a traditional sector as that of, um, of being a, wood, a woodsmith, basically. And to convince some of our students to attend these trainings in Pesaro, uh, we had had a particularly hard time, but once the training had been provided, then they realized how useful it was going to be. They needed 12 new voluntary people uh, to acquire the necessary skills in order to uh, master the, the new machines and technologies shown to them. And in fact, there was suddenly an influx of 22 uh, voluntary applications. So basically, uh, part of our responsibilities is to make sure that the information is distributed so as to make people aware of uh, the uh, challenges. In fact, otherwise, they're, they're not, not going to realize what's going on, and they will find themselves sidetracked by a competition on um, on their own market. And so that starts, as you say, from the level of school onwards, and of course universities or higher education. We've got to make sure that these two professional and academic world um, do not run on parallel tracks anymore. And 
start to operate in a more mutually aware way. So the state, at this stage, I believe, is still admittable in terms of digital revolution. I don't know if you're currently uh, filling your tax declaration. But I think it works in a rather impressively smooth way. It is has all been digitalized. For example, Ampo.gov, you know this website. It's become a game to play, to pay your any kind of parking tickets, for example. I had to, thanks to the flash code, paying your VAT or paying um, or paying your real estate tax, for example, is big is a big game, as we said, and so that shows that demonstration motivation. Um, when you give yourself the necessary means, can lead to some very practical and efficient results. True. Well, if I may say so, the CPA works really well online. You can open an account very easily and you can access your personal um, your personal web space in order to keep track of what your social rights are. That's another aspect which is sometimes not well communicated on. Good of you to say so. Yes, we shouldn't be um, accused of being hyper-liberal. Um, by wanting to introduce the know-how of a company or vocational training, basically, in the context of a school, and also by mentioning what is called reversal mentoring. That's to say that the younger's influence will also impact and have an input in the digital revolution. The other way around, yes. Of course, the whole issue is to define more clearly what you mean by bringing closer the academic and professional spheres Surely we need to build bridges between those two um, worlds, and some of them already exist, I think. I believe that the awareness of the relevance of these bridges is becoming more apparent to all gradually. Uh, we know that some companies are working on digital projects to make sure that some of their activities are available online, made available online to certain teachers or professors at university and so um, some of these progress may appear discreet or um, isolated at this stage because there isn't a, uh, enough publicity made about them but but gradually things follow their course. I just briefly wanted to bounce on another aspect that you had mentioned before i.e. put the human factor at the heart of all parameters. That is undeniably, I think, a um, priority for all of us, but perhaps once more we should clarify the concept we use here. Sometimes the status used puts the emphasis on the growing uh, importance of the uh, independence, independence or autonomy, basically, of the human factor, and also the importance of finding and giving meaning to what you're doing um, and your work and, and really stressing how you are contributing to shaping a collective uh, project or a collective society, basically. And I know that among our members, some training are revolutionary in that respect because they try to um, convey certain knowledge in a more cooperative rather than an authoritative way. And the older gen well, participants from older generations are sometimes thrown off, in fact, by these approaches. But it depends on the activity sector. But I think the metamorphosis concerns the whole sector. And um, practically, revolves around uh, the use of time. The use and splitting or divide, division of your time in the days um, where you work. The tools, of course, that you uh, that are available to you and that enable you to um, mix the private and professional spheres, well, physical as well as time frontiers in a more blurred way. The issue of um, the premises, the working premises as well. I'm quite impressed to see um, the speed at which co-working spaces are developing all over France, or also spaces dedicated to people 
Well, basically, those cooperative uh, offices are available to not only team workers, but independent freelancers who would be more uh, loan goers, if you like, or of a lonely temperament, but nevertheless know that they can find some sort of comfort in running into people by sharing some of these working premises. And then, last but not least, a form, a new form of um, social recognition or status, because we talk a bit too much sometimes about promotions and hierarchies that in fact only go to deepen the existing um, social uh, divide between the qualified and unqualified or skilled and less skilled workers. And what we often see in our companies is that those who already access information today are the better skilled ones. And so the real challenge, in fact, is to not aggravate the digital divide um, by making sure that everyone can access this information. And that requires a job on which we are def in which we're definitely investing quite a lot of energy, that's to say, developing and promoting the um, lifelong learning concept. Because this should enable you to overcome the supposed difficulty of, oh, well, I was not given the opportunity in my not-so-golden youth to basically follow up on whatever my ideals or um, uh, intellectual ambitions might have been. We want to make sure that this is no longer a recurrent theme. <coughs> but we might go through a transitional phase where this divide between those who were given a chance in the first place will much uh, more quickly uh, access other uh, training courses when the others will be left behind. Okay, and Jean-Marc, would you like to perhaps build on those practical examples, talk about democratize, democratization, even though it may sound as a strong word at least once. I know that I worked for Pernod for a while and our best course um, on the digitalization of the company was somebody who was in charge of a warehouse in Cognac. And he kept telling us by saying, OK, we're going to start by training the uh, white colors. And in fact, that that was unfortunately the sign that um, our training's um, purpose had not been un fully understood because, in fact, we, don't, we want to make sure that it is not limited and restricted the white colors it used to beforehand. So uh, we know that currently, by means of MOOCs and internet, 1.5 billion people are um, able to access the best professor or expert who was so far only limited to some sort of uh, management or managing elite or executive programs. Um, so these platforms are very promising in my opinion, though those platforms are carrying a form of sharing of knowledge, basically. And we are members of a collective in Lausanne which enables us to observe uh, the, the huge discrepancies existing from one country to another. For example, in Switzerland, it would be just in, inconceivable to have um, uh, uh, the same means as the um, education ministry, basically, to set up certain trainings, but um, surely a good way of preserving or passing certain codes is to learn the base of maths, geography, or whatever. But then um, those famous statistics of how many percent of people pass the baccalaureate, 
um, are not so much of an issue, and the Swiss have long understood that, in fact, that even though and uh, because only 30 percent of uh, the people of Pasta Baccalaureate, it's an advantage and an asset for artisans to develop side vocational studies and um, skills. And that is certainly something that culturally the French should integrate uh, gradually by by um, giving, uh, by giving vocational training its uh, proper value and its proper credits back, basically. True, you're, all, you're very well represented in uh, the field of uh, artificial intelligence yourself. You recently acquired a startup and you developed a hub of artificial intelligence. You even acquired, I think, the American Citizenship Corp Academy is based in Switzerland. You were among the European leaders. So. Uh, we saw that in the list of the top 20 uh, world companies, there are no French yet, and we don't want to dwell upon these uh, regrettable statistics, but wouldn't training, wouldn't a solution be a training accessible to all, um, horizontally and across all social as well as age categories? And a little, uh, perhaps, a hint for the Minister of the National Education who had initially accepted our invitation, but apparently he needed to attend there. Council of Ministers uh, meeting, which is at its formative stage still very uh, strategically important, certainly. But he had on Saint Pascal Aslan's um, invitation in his quality of president of the ESSEC, and he would have made it, but. Um, as we said, he had an emergency meeting, and from what we know of his opinion, without wanting to take um, words out of his absent mouth, he would have been very much in favor of the sharing, further development of the sharing of uh, skills and know-how in order to protect the people's rights and make sure that access to knowledge and innovation as well as entrepreneurship can be uh, fostered in the context of your professional training uh, by putting in relationship between one another all sorts of uh, um, corporate knowledge and it is as much a source of wealth and precious gems in fact as big data collections are uh, nowadays and reverse mentoring is all about this as well as enabling the younger people to teach us about some of their viewpoints and feedbacks uh, because in terms of, uh, well, social networks, operability, we know that the younger generation, my own children, of course, are um, more familiar with tweets and other collective networks, nuts and bolts. So, Francois, you spoke a little earlier on about collaborative contracts. I know that this... Um, is a topical issue that you could discuss further with some political as well as executive uh, actors. And Marie-Louise Léon, Marie-Louise Léon, sorry. You put the emphasis on uh, developing more uh, active protections for the independent workers. So obviously we are... Um, making a little headway there, I think, for uh, practical solutions that would be uh, effectively shared by all the uh, economic actors. What would be your conclusion uh, on this optimistic note? Well, I think that at the end of the day, we share certainly the same anxieties and hopes. And um, of course, we can't agree on everything, but... That's quite normal and part of the enriching dimension of the debate. I believe, nevertheless, that one should look at, uh, as I often say, in the vast majority of companies, it applies to bigger as well as small and medium-sized company. Um, we have a lot more in common than separating us. And the vision that we are standing for of the company is that it is a common good and that this common good should be uh, assumed by all the participants in the social orchestra, basically. 
qui aujourd'hui, à mon avis, euh, ce qu'on défend vraiment... Euh, By um, assuming what they consider a normal uh, role depending on their skills and what needs to be revisited, I think, um, or at least we considered useful to revisit at the CPM, is that we can clearly sense how much any company needs to give meaning to what it's doing in order to continue recruit and convince. And we can sense that this is what contributes most remarkably to the added value. It's not so much a question of financial aspects, salaries, but it really has more to do with the meaning of um, meaning assigned by the workers or collaborators to this work, basically, and its contribution to a greater good. And in our quality of managers, we need to be able to hear this message and to respond to the solicitation. Hence, the notion of, co of, of collaboration, indeed, and beyond this digital transformation of society, I think, there are some extremely practical problems that are posed. What do we do about the hierarchy or the subordination link? What do we do about social security tending to disappear? And these practical points, um, of course, should um, uh, make allowance for some diverging views, but I believe that if we have a common, a sufficient minimum common denominator, basically, then a lot can be done, and that's the whole spirit in which the negotiation was engaged between the RSE uh, with the CPME, because we consider it a very topical, innovating way to envisage relationship between these social partners and break the traditional cleavage. Marie-Louise Antonio Costanzo, do you have conclusions on your conclusions, would you say? Marie-Louise, ladies first. Well, no real further point to add on to what's been said before, but to bounce on what Mr. Aslan said regarding the question of meaning. Some transformation clearly is in, on its way and in progress, uh, deeply modifying the work uh, fundamentals and work structure. And a survey was computed uh, quite recently, about a few weeks or nearly a month ago, on work, um, including about 200,000 participants, which is a good score and covering uh, more than 100 different questions. We had two main answers that are still being processed, but the um, uh, question that had the highest score of response had to do with the fact that a new quality of, of salary employees, 72% of the participants wanted to be more involved in the decision-making process that applied to them. So without going as far as saying that the company is a common good that needs to be co-managed, I nevertheless uh, would agree uh, to say that in terms of covenants and co-governance, some improvement can be made in order to better articulate the social dialogue that is uh, already in place by making the employees feel more responsible, basically, of their fate and the company's future decisions, therefore. I do believe that among the pure players, such as Uber or Corp Academy and so on, Jean-Marc was talking about the architecture, uh, literally, of the working premises, say the open planning offices and so on, or the fact that some of the buildings are conceived more horizontally and at a lower level than the tall uh, towering buildings. Does, does that reflect enough, according to you, the future collaborative kind of uh, operation and working mode? Yes, well, I think on the working premise, it goes beyond the purely material or architectural aspect of uh, this digital revolution, I think. The deeper fundamental principles of your relationship to yourself and to others have been affected, in fact. And there is a question arising at the level of the company on the rules 
of who takes what decision at the end of the day. And I think that some novel organizations with novel decisions contributing to the whole are gradually changing or reshaping the whole, of course, and you need to remain as clear and uh, straightforward as possible or transparent as possible on what is expected by and of you. So it means that <coughs> a lot of these changes have been introduced on a project basis, whether one needs to invest in a robot, for example, and therefore considers resorting to some sort of crowdfunding or other strategies. But the project mode of operating is by definition a collaborative one. The example of a robot to be invested in is not a bad one. Yes, well, the agile, what we call also the agile method. So it's all a matter of um, taking things from the right side and understand that causality links between them, basically. I remember speaking to a um, colleague of mine working, attending a seminar in the uh, Silicon Valley in California and coming back to our works council and saying, oh, great, I attended some of those local meetings over there, and I believe we should start by investing in a baby foot to include in our cafeteria. And that was certainly not the thing to start with, if you see what I mean. It might have been an interesting symptom derived from uh, the nice spirit in which the negotiations were taking place. So you've got to um, start by picking the right priorities in order to be ambitious and make the world a better place, as uh, John Lennon would have said. Some of you might be familiar with the, familiar with the HPO Silicon Valley series on Netflix. I don't know. If not, I would warmly recommend it. But anyway, there's a very relevant uh, picture there of the uh, not top down, no longer top down, but bottom up sort of structure. And the baby foot is really the cherry um, or the icing on the cake, if you like, not the first thing you want to be thinking of when you want to transform your uh, work environment or your uh, structure and, and, and move from 15 to 9. Uh, echelons in the hierarchy, for example, could be a progress already. And when I moved to Google, for example, I only had three uh, echelons of uh, the hierarchy above myself. So all of this goes hand in hand with the scrub and the agile method and the uh, new concepts that have been thrown in the air. Yes, Antonio, can you confirm all of this? You know you bear uh, USA or America from the inside as well. Would you say that in a collaborative mode that we are uh, thinking of in terms of idea development, for example, uh, you're working happily and you're satisfied? Existent. There are a number of interesting solutions, the self-driving car, and well, fan of artificial intelligence that might be applied to your uh, whatever robot, robotization challenge on your working premise. How would you translate the mindset? within uh, the, the Uber uh, pure player. Well, that was already quite well described, I think, by um, my colleague here on the left. In fact, it's a very horizontal type of uh, structure. I had to manage some, supposedly some companies, but in fact, I wasn't managing teams or, or companies of people as much as individuals because my job really was to define the roles of those who had to then appropriate themselves the project. And none of them had to report, strictly speaking, to me, even though I was the one assigning or attributing uh, them to the project. And if these delegates need to discuss or exchange with some other colleagues, it's all very good for them, but they will nevertheless remain, remain accountable and responsible for the project at the end of the day. So, <coughs> And that's what younger people and younger generation take for granted now. They don't really uh, expect you to uh, pour out an academic magisterial uh, course uh, to them on the first day of their um, of the work, uh, course number one to three, and then four to six for the two last days of the company. So, no, you're right. In order to consume digital, and, in, and I would say eat up slowly or, or familiarize ourselves with those uh, digital revolutions I mentioned, don't hesitate again to ask, either ask questions or share with us some elements of solutions if you've got some. Questions and answers once the microphone has been circulating. 
Okay, my, I'm an economist and I work for the company Zephira. Um, and to answer Francois, your solution suggestion, I think that one of the possible solutions would enabling uh, managers and employers to share competences would be to uh, work on the basis of a collaborative contract. Yes, that uh, already exists at the level of certain working shared working premises, in fact, which hire people permanently so as to make them available part-time to whatever company or startup may need them without uh, forcing these companies to hire those people full-time. Um, that, of course, gives a lot of flexibility to the new customer service to uh, um, benefit from these employers know how only when there is a demand for it, not on a permanent basis and they usually The employer will uh, therefore stand for any kind of horizontal functional organization. As opposed to the more specialized vertical structure of the uh, company that will be able to dedicate and cons dedicate part of its uh, resources to those more skilled a uh, specialized set of skills. Yes, that's what, at least what we expect from the uh, increasing implementation of the collaborative contract, in fact. And what uh, makes people quite happy with the system, in fact, because within a single week they may combine various professional experiences depending on their availability and the needs in the company. Very um, truthful and interesting intervention indeed. Uh, for example, another example is if in a small company you can't afford to have a human resources director, well, if you uh, share a HR officer between two to three companies in a hub, then it's more doable and realistic. Same for the secretary, uh, social secretariat. True. And you're addressing a person who has the security of his employment by being securely employed by this uh, consortium. Okay, sure. So another um, suggestion concerning a collaborative contract. Uh, in your uh, idea? Well, the President of the Republic should be tackling this issue as it was part of the 89 propositions during the electoral campaign. Then there will also be a reform of the UNEDIC. Uh, coming up soon, uh, presumably the uh, pensions insurance will be uh, discussed at great length. To see whether we should uh, discuss this also in a separate collaborative contract. Any question or reaction from our audience or from the floor of the stage? Yes. We can see that there are still human beings sitting behind the microphones, <gasps> whether in the interpretation booth or in the room, because it takes a little while to reach us. So, I'm very happy to attend this Congress here. I work for the Ministry of uh, um, Ecology and Sustainable Building. And I can assure you that there are several thousands of professionals dedicating their time to see how they can most appropriately make sure that there is a proper mutation of the modern building industry and economy. And the good news is that MOOC has been clearly identified as one of the major support, revolutionary support for teaching. And with the ad hoc, we created a French speaking as well as French francophone MOOCs. Um, in the light of sustainable development. And, of course, the slight drawback, and my collaborators probably wouldn't agree with what I'm saying because on the whole this platform is very popular, is that we are trying to govern this platform in a participatory fashion so as to make sure projects of 
quality can be validated without a commercial bias. And I don't know how you could help us find other constructive solutions because there are so many people who know the rules but who don't really want to open up to new solutions that just uh, say uh, enthusiastic about this or that MOOC and they want to close the door behind having uh, inserted this uh, Trojan horse in the current existing edifice. edifice. Um, and those who realize that We're still fiddling around, basically, on how to share qualitatively interesting projects between us all. Good, yes. Well, I find this way of presenting the subject matter quite interesting. We've got our <coughs> teachers specializing in the... Um, Education, educational methods, because as you know, uh, pedagogy is, is, is in fact a subject matter, a university, academic subject matter in itself. And Professor Pierre Dilimbour, who's a pundit in terms of MOOCs, was asked whether we, uh, whether he deemed it a success, whether we, whether he knew whether it worked or not. And his only answer was no. You don't know un until you've tested and learned out of it, basically. But what is sure is that the digital revolution uh, makes you more accountable and responsible because the only way of, well, the, the, the means are there and available to the vast majority of us to proceed with this trial and error approach, an empirical uh, decision-making process of your life path. So I'm hoping this does not apply to, say, uh, airline or submarines or railroad uh, sectors, but for anything that can afford a certain dose of experimentation, I think it's uh, comforting to see that France was prompt to react, for example, and follow suit to the American platforms, um, be it the eastern or the western uh, coastlines of America. And um, I think it was um, even better than the reinvention of the SICAM or the Concorde at the time of... Uh, Deep competition between our two continents. So I believe France on that subject of MOOCs um, is rather unbeatable. In fact, EdTech is one of those good examples emerged in France already. And so, as you know, from a, a well, etymological as well as philosophical point of view, in MOOC, the uh, one of the words, part of the acronym is open. So any closed system is doomed basically to disappear in the long run under the auspices of such a um, popular new method of learning, basically. So, once you hit the right chord, basically, there's no reason why it should. It shouldn't democratize itself by uh, broadening its scope to the rest of the world. And certificates can and should be given to younger people who, with a single smartphone and from uh, an initial capital of 40 pounds, would have enough knowledge and awareness to participate in this or that MOOC. And in the field of learning, uh, the expertise lies, as we know, within the arcanes of the company. So any closed system, whether professional or academic, is, as we're hoping, doomed to disappear in the course of the 21st century. And the last point I wanted to raise was that the, among the representatives of the various umbrella organizations uh, who were invited to this panel, we have, we're in the process of finishing to install a SOS system uh, that will reduce the f fixed cost, basically, to the production of it, the production cost of a course, and that's all. So you could perfectly well imagine at the level of a uh, sort of holding or grouping of company, one could share and amortize really easily the only fixed cost of the uh, 
course dispensation, which can go up to 30 or 40, 50,000 years, which is, of course, unbearable for a single company. But for a federation of company divided up by 30,000 members, it's only one euro per collaborator. So we shall be more and more looking out for uh, scaling effects. And I believe that the French people are really good at managing their scalability already. Uh, even though other companies are more, a little more wary about this phenomenon. On this mode, when you're an American based in California coding or developing code lines, uh, you're lucky and fortunate enough to have a market of more than 500,000 million people, uh, which is still 10 times more than 10 times more than the French benefit from. So the structuring challenges probably make you uh, progress faster. Okay, well, we'll discuss further the issue of MOOCs this afternoon with Pascal Asla, among others, because the uh, Pascal is editing a MOOC, uh, which is rather popular. Um, that was already mentioned earlier this morning, and I believe we've reached perhaps the end of uh, the time allotted for this morning's session, unless you have any more questions. There are no stupid questions, by the way. Would you prefer express yourself in French or English, or one of the 24 languages officially recognized on the continent. Then I'll ask Pascal to step in with some concluding remarks, and thank you all for your participation in this first round table. Well, then, listen, um, what can I say? I don't know if you appreciated as much as I did the high-flying quality of these exchanges, which could be uh, uh, compared to a mini MOOC in a way. And in fact, it should be published on YouTube from the end of this week or next week onwards. Um, so there remains only for me to thank you for coming. It is a limitless subject matter, to be honest. So, of course, I also have a robot at home already, but it's just a coffee machine, and we don't have the same size of company uh, to run uh, at this stage, but I still believe that most of your interventions were uh, very much to the point uh, with respect to the subject matter of this digital revolutions possible impact on uh, uh, the shared economy we're living in. And uh, other than that, you'll find a buffet open and offered to all of you on the second floor. Thank you once more for being back.